All the day's football results and reaction with Ray Stubbs on score. For now here on BBC One, Hazel Irving with an afternoon of snooker. Good afternoon. Our new snooker season begins where the last one ended, in the home of the sport, Sheffield. But instead of their normal 17-day stint in this city, these gentlemen have only packed one dress shirt for a single afternoon of quick-fire one-frame snooker because Hot Black is back for one fun-filled afternoon only in this rather grand Sheffield City Hall. Now, everyone, I don't know if you know this, gentlemen, from the Beatles to Morrissey to the Pet Shop Boys to the Sugar Babes has played this venue. Not that Mark Williams is interested. And now Messrs <laughs> Murphy, Ebden, Dorothy, Robertson, Williams, Hendry, Higgins and Dot are about to do the same. Yes, this is the handsome room with its high ceiling and pillars that we'll be spending our afternoon here in Sheffield City Hall. Well, it's a very intimate atmosphere today and we've got uh, a lot of spectators here. Just a, a few, in fact, hand-picked, of course. And they're going to be enjoying the entertainment at their own tables that will be provided by the entertainment on this one. Well, it really is a very small, intimate, friendly gathering for snooker watchers, but the prize is suitably precious because there is a whole lot of history wrapped up in this tiny little trophy, about 38 years worth, to be precise. And it dates back to the days when snooker was first broadcast on the telly in the late 1960s. Now, some of the greats of the game, the likes of Charlton and Reardon, Spencer, White and Davis, have all got their hands on this. And let me introduce you to the eight men who will be trying to grasp their opportunity this afternoon. Ah, cue the music. Well, that's sure to put us in the pot black mood. And this is the draw. Eight players, and unlike events down the road at the Crucible, we are straight into the quarterfinals. Normally, it would take us about a week and a half to get to that point in Sheffield. Former pot black runner-up Sean Murphy takes on the reigning UK champion Peter Ebden. Aussie left-hander Neil Robertson's the only man in the field who's yet to win a world title. And he plays Stephen Hendry, who's won more of those than anyone else in the modern era. Seven at last count. Meanwhile, the reigning Crucible champion of world number one, John Higgins, takes on old crafty. Yes, Ken Doherty is fresh from his first tourney win of the year in Ireland. And the last of our quarterfinals sees Snooker's little big man, the 2006 world champion, Graham Dot, up against the reigning pot black holder, Mark Williams. And before we get underway, we're going to play Name That Tune with Stephen John. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Name that tune, please. Uh, winner for that, well, uh, black and white something. Rag. John, put him right. It's the black and white rag, and it was written by, do you know this, George Botsford. Very good. That's, uh, that's pretty good for pub quiz team members out there. Um, it's very nice to be back in Sheffield, gentlemen, especially when we don't have to bring our camp beds into the studio. It's a one-hit wonder this afternoon. It's good fun. You've played and won this tournament three times. What do you remember of it, Steve? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, actually, it was recorded at Christmas time, around the Christmas period, in between that, that new year at the Pebble Mill Studios in Birmingham. Uh, empty, the studios were. But for me, my memories was, was as a kid watching it. It was the, you know, it was what started me off. I was sat watching with my father, and then all of a sudden, there I was playing in it. A dream come true. Even though it was such a small event, it had a, a very, very big uh, moment in snooker's history. It did indeed. And John, it's something that really, I guess, inspired you as well, because you won the Junior Port Black Series not once, but. <laughs> 
twice, I believe. Yeah, that's what you get for being younger than Steve, you see. I didn't get to play in the proper one, but I played the junior one. Uh, fantastic to know that you could play on television. A great innovation. Ted Lowe, it was his idea to get the best juniors in, and thankfully I managed to win a couple of times and set me on my way. It's £10,000 work. Well, that's what the winner will get for three frames. That's not a bad return on effort, is it? That's right, but of course, uh, all the players want to win that, and um, there's no, there's no really, really anybody that's really that strong a favourite, and so they're all in with a chance, I think. I was going to ask you, the, the bookies actually make John Higgins, the reigning world champion, the 9-2 to two favourite. Can you really have a favourite in a one-frame shootout, John? Absolutely not. I don't know how they've priced it up. They've probably just picked on John because he's the world champion and finished in form, but to be honest with you, toss of a coin every match. You just don't know who's going to win. Looking forward to it, Steve? Yeah, it should be good fun. It's always nice to see the players a bit under pressure one frame. They've got to get off to a good start, otherwise they're out. Absolutely, yes. One mistake or one big break is what will do it in these single frame format matches today. Now, if you don't want to watch big boys knocking seven bells out of one another this afternoon elsewhere, why don't you relax and join us for a jovial and very skillful afternoon with a touch of nostalgia about it in this pot black trophy competition. Well, the first match we're going to see is the first of the quarterfinals. As I say, it usually takes us about 10 days to get to that stage here in Sheffield, <laughs> but we're straight into it with Peter Ebden. Now, Peter is perhaps one of the most charming men you could meet away from the table. At it, he is formidable and an ardent competitor, all right. Earlier this year, he achieved one of his lifetime ambitions by becoming the United Kingdom champion, and he beat two formidable Scots on the way, John Higgins in the semi and Stephen Hendry in the final. He knows he's going to win. 65. It was a little bit of an anti-climax really winning the UK Championship because neither myself or Stephen played particularly well and yet we'd both played very well up to that point and it's just the way it goes sometimes. Um, players can produce very good performances up to and including say the semi-finals but that's just the way it goes and you know you're there to win at the end of the day so it was a Fantastic achievement for me, the first time in 16 years as a pro that I won the UK Championship and it was a great honour for me to become, I think only the, the ninth player I think I, I became, um, to win both the World Championship and the UK Championship, so it was, uh, it was good, great. Peter's opponent is fellow Englishman Sean Murphy, who became the second youngest world champion in history at the Crucible when ranked as a 150 to 1 outsider. He's an audacious potter, he's now ranked number three in the world, and he's been speaking to Steve about his chances today. So, Peter Ebden, first match. You enjoy pot black, don't you? I really like pot black, and it's it's a funny scenario in just being one frame, but Peter's about the toughest draw I could have got. But, you know, I've been practicing hard through the summer and not that that really matters in a one-frame tournament. <laughs> well, uh, last season, a uh, successful season, won the Malta Cup, mm. but disappointing in the World Championship. Yeah, it took a long time to get over to my loss to Selby in the semis. I mean, we're good mates, but it, it took a long time to... Because I really chucked the match away, to be fair. I was 5-1 up and then got beat by the one-frame, and, you know, it was hard, and hopefully today won't be the same story. You've had a couple of years now at the top of the game, the, the very top. Uh, it looks like you're going to be here for a long, long time. What are your aspirations for this season? Well, I hope what you say is true, and I, and I hope I am. Um, this season, you know, I, I'd like to do a lot better in the tournaments that the BBC show, and you know, we've got the, the Grand Prix next week, and you know, I'd really like to do well in that. It's all right doing well in the other sort of satellite events, but you know, it's nice to do well, and so that the, 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 the British public can see you and, and, and that you can do well and, and, and entertain them, and that's what I'm hoping for. Good luck, cheers. So we've got two former Crucible champions going head to head and they're watched over in the commentary box by another two, Steve Davis and Dennis Taylor. Just as in the old days, it's down to the toss of a coin to see who will break off in these one frame deciders. We've got two referees in action today, Arian Williams and first Michaela Tab. And as always, it's Richard Bear who's making the introductions. Well, will you please welcome the reigning United Kingdom and the reigning Malta Cup champion, respectively, Peter Ebden and the Wisdom Warrior, Sean Murphy. Peter Ebden to break. Peter Ebden, who's won the toss and has elected to break off. Which sometimes 
is not always the case, Steve. I remember when we used to play in the early Pop Blacks with it being a one frame. You didn't really want to win the toss in case you, in case you made a bad break off. <laughs> Things have probably moved on since then, but uh, of course you've got to get that white ball in the bottom half of the table. That looks to be okay. I think the blue's blocking the path through to the red that's on for the left corner pocket. There you can see it. Not enough room to get to the potting angle. And with it being the one frame, we always say it's a little bit of a lottery if you get to the final of a nine frame match. But it's very exciting and Pop Black has always been exciting. Obviously in a, a longer match the last snooker that was seen on BBC was the World Championships. Perhaps players would be being a bit more aggressive in their choice of shots, but in a, a one-frame match, you can't afford that many mistakes. But this looks like a chance. Not the best safety shot in the world there from Peter Ebden. Gettable pot, but it's all about position. Yeah, just keep your eye on the white here. It's going to go between the reds and that single red, you would think. And not a bad kiss. Yeah. And if it's gone past the straight potting angle, this is a good chance for Sean Murphy. And I think he's OK here, Steve. Yes, he couldn't have hoped for a better result from that positional shot. Gives himself first chance at making a break. And the balls are not badly split up. Obviously that red by the black spot, which is going to see how this threaded its way through the pack, just a clip off that red. It's going to have a problem with the red by the black spot. It would probably be nicer to have got that out of the way first, but couldn't risk playing from the blue down to that red. So a bit of work to be done now. Yeah, I'm just wondering that red you mentioned, Steve, it might be available into the left 14. corner pocket. Um, yeah, it will pass the black. It's it's tied up into the, and it's blocking the path for the black. So Sean might be able to do something about that here if he if he gets the correct angle and he can Thank screw you. back and maybe leave this red on for the same pocket as the black. Yes, it could have been a problem, but uh, not with great position like that. Couldn't have asked for the cue ball better placed to screw back across the face of the red. 22. Now you see the audience, they've all got their own personal table here. It was a little bit like the boxing used to be, I suppose. Not a bad idea, Steve. Now we do a few lunches occasionally where people sit around like this and it's a good atmosphere. Yeah, I, when the waiters start serving up all the potatoes, obviously we're going to put the players off, but <laughs> to deal with that when it happens in the quarterfinals and semi-final stages, obviously. I suppose you're going to tell me next there'll be potted shrimps on the menu, yeah? <coughs> Just make sure they get plenty of greens. Well, he's left himself one into the middle pocket or one into the corner. Doesn't look to be ideal on both, but uh, he's close to this red. You will know, he'll know immediately whether he's got it. 31. He hasn't got the position, though. But a useful 31-point lead. Now that's a pretty good Sean shot. Murphy, As Steve mentioned, he's got the 30 point lead. And purposely, Sean pushed the black onto the side cushion. Because that's to his advantage with having that lead. That's fairly safe there. Yes, 
It's all about percentages to some degree. Any type of lead in a, a frame of snooker is okay. It's not a, a huge margin, but putting that black on the side cushion does increase your chances of the game getting scrappy. The way these have opened up, this is a great chance now for Sean. Should he knock this in, he'll be favourite. Well, he's played it too well. I mean, look where he's put the white. <laughs> I mean, that's a brilliant safety shot, but the fact he knocked the red and he didn't want the white anywhere near the cushion. Anything other than tight on the bottom cushion, he would be green. able to perhaps green. play a very good roll up behind the green or the brown, but now very hard to get this a complete snooker. Seems to have done pretty well. Very difficult on these very fast cloths to play a dead weight roll up. Make sure you hit the ball, but not leave it too far away. So problems now and big ones for Peter Ebden. Yes, absolutely, Steve. I can't see a red that he can nestle onto. He'd like to play the one behind the black spot, but there's no path through to that to hit it from behind. So he's, he's going to have to pull out a very good shot here and going to do well to get this safe. Do you think he'll play a dead weight roll up or do you think he'll have a, an aeroplane shot and smash him and hope to get lucky? Because that can that's a good good percentage shot as well sometimes. Well let's see how he's winding the cue action up. Now it looks yeah. No, he just it had wasn't no, a full aeroplane. <laughs> he, he had no idea where that was going. And uh, okay, the pink's now tied up as well, but with the blue in the open and the reds as they are, he could give himself a good lead here. want that kiss on the pink in some respects but uh, could have gone a little bit strange on the pot for the red there but this looks to be okay the full ball kiss on that pink would have been lovely but the flick could have produced problems and you would think now from this position that Sean Murphy is into the next phase of the tournament Not much Peter can do about this, really. He's played one loose safety shot, and that's about it. Tough pot black, one frame. In fact, Peter Ebden got to the semi-finals of the Pop Black last year, and in that semi-final, he didn't score a point. He lost 81-0 to John Higgins. So this is his next visit onto the Pop Black table, and he hasn't potted the ball yet, but he hasn't had a chance, has he, Steve? No, of course, I think the early Pop Blacks, um, in its original format, was um, a 13-week uh, tournament, I think, based uh, with uh, the first bit was league. Phase. So you had three matches in your group of four. This is a bit more cutthroat than that. Straightforward knockout, one day event. And you can detect that little smile there in Peter's face, which you don't normally see. And he's probably thinking back, well, the last time I was here, I never got a shot and never scored. I've had to wait a year and now I haven't had a shot again. He said the waistcoat dry clean, especially for the start of the new season as well. And basically it's just dirty these trousers in the nicest possible sense. Sean looks in good form though, doesn't he? 27. Yeah, it's only a matter of weeks ago, both players uh, lost in the Shanghai Masters uh, first ranking event of the season. They both lost in the last 32, so... 
Sean will be the more happier here. Peter travelled all the way from Dubai. Uh, Sean just up the road in Rotherham. 34. It's a slightly bigger taxi fare back to Dubai, I think. Still smiling. Will he? Will he? he he's got to come back to the table. He, he, he can't really win the frame now, but I'm sure he wants to at least pot a couple of balls. <coughs> he has got a sniff of a chance now, the way the balls have uh, gone badly for Sean. Is he looking at a trick shot here? Cushion first and try and pot this red in the middle pocket? Yeah, safety is well involved in that as well, because the cue ball goes to the top cushion. Not enough, though. That's. Well, lifeline for he Peter. For. He can't win the frame. He needs a snooker. And the balls are not ideally situated, that's for sure. But he's got to carry on. So it looks like Sean Murphy's into the quarter final, but <laughs> a little bit left. Of course, in the early days of Pop Black, with it being live as well, I believe. Uh, I think well, they had certainly played the matches live in, uh, in the space of 25 minutes. The frame had to be got over. The directors would be tearing their hair out now, just uh, thinking about if it was an overrun. Yes, they used to tell us back in the 70s, Steve, to try and get the frame over as near to 22 minutes as possible. And I remember Eddie Charlton saying at one of the meetings, if you think I'm coming all the way from Australia, he said, if it's going to take an hour and a half, it'll take an hour and a half. Clever shot there by Peter, getting the blackout in, into play. Very clever, but that's a brilliant shot there from Sean. That is brilliant. Hampered by the black. black. One. Oh. Just putting the knife in there. And that is game over. <laughs> there you go. Peter says, in case you didn't hear it, I can see I'm going to have to move somewhere closer for next year's Pop Black. <laughs> oh. Sean Murphy, eight. Yeah, I think he comes. There's no point in carrying on. The smiling Peter Ebden shakes the hand of Sean Murphy. It was the early break of 30 that paved the way, and it's given Sean Murphy the frame. Well, it was a long way to come from Dubai, not to pot a ball, but uh, Sean Murphy is not complaining. Well done, Sean. Thank Enjoy you. that one today. Thank you. It wasn't so far for me because I just live a mile away. Exactly, yes. <laughs> Tell us about the spirit here in this arena for the pot bike tournament because you, of course, have been a finalist. John and I have been watching over the last couple of years and you seem to really enjoy this competition, Sean. I like the light-heartedness of it. For me, I mean, I really enjoy playing snooker full stop. Even in, in Sheffield, I play in the local Sheffield League because I just enjoy it and um, come in here and we just have a knock and, it, and it's good and it's good that there's not the, not the pressure of the ranking points and we can just you know be a lot freer and, and enjoy ourselves it's great am I right in saying you got dropped one year for losing your first couple of matches it's uh, <laughs> come on it's an in-house joke at the club where I play that I can't get in the team it's a joke in fact I won last week so uh, yeah, yeah, well I'll done. Chalk that one congratulations Thank you. Play. cheers <laughs> Uh, it seems a bit trite even to ask you if there's a great determination to win this one, but, but genuinely, it'd be a lovely thing to win, wouldn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. I mean, I was just chatting to someone, actually, and I was saying that how lucky we are that the tournament's been brought back, because it's got such a history, mm. and now we've all got the chance of getting our name on that famous trophy, because it's as famous as any trophy in the game. It's a, well, it would be a great honour to win. Well, you're into the semi-final. That was at 11 o'clock this morning, so you can enjoy your lunch. But generally speaking, Sean, you're up to world number three now, I believe, up a couple of places. Mm. It was your ambition, still is, to become world number one. You're inching ever closer. Feeling yeah. confident this time? Yeah, I mean, if I can have a good season, um, I, there's no reason why I can't get there this year. But that, that, that spot's not going to go anywhere. And, you know, if I can stay within a couple of it, or, or, or no worse, really, then uh, I should be OK. I'm, this year, I want to do better in the tournaments that are shown nationwide and it's good doing well in the, the sort of satellite events but if I can do well in the tournaments watched by the, the British public then that would be good. Now in terms of preparation it's not been a great summer for this gentleman here no. John. Is um, that a tough? Bit of a washout let's be honest. 
Well, for all of us who live in the local area, it's been a it's been a nightmare through the summer. You know, the floods that attacked Sheffield and Rotherham and Doncaster. You know, we didn't escape. We were on holiday at the time. We came home, and we put the telly on Sky News, and there it was. They've just evacuated Meadow Hall and our village and other villages around. And we were like, this this has got to be a joke. This can't be happening. And we rang our parents who were at the house, and you know, they were like, you know, it's okay. We're here. We're looking after it, but the water is rising. And there's a stream that flows down behind our house, and it rose about eight foot all in, and it was it was literally that far from coming in the house. I mean, it was it's devastated the surrounding area. So did it do much damage to your property then? It's um, it's meant a new drive and a new new turf and new fence panels and and all of that. And you know the floods were months ago, and the building work has literally just finished this week. So uh, snooker's been about second or third priority. So. Maybe I'll be a bit fresher. Yeah, well, glad to see the back of it, I'm sure, Sean, yeah. and uh, wish you all the best for the coming season, of course. Okay. Semi-finals, does the pressure start to mount? You know what it's like in this pop like semi. Do you have to concentrate that much harder now? Not really. I mean, it's it's just a case of one mistake, really. You know, if um, and if, I think all you know when you get to this as well, one for, all you're looking for is a chance, isn't it? Absolutely. You just want to have one chance to say that at least I got a look at a ball and it was in my own destiny. I mean, the worst part about it is if you don't get a pot. Absolutely. Poor old Peter, in that case, yeah. Right, (laughs) we'll move on, shall we? Enjoy your lunch and we'll see you in the semi shortly. Thanks, Sean. Well, you know, I'm completely surrounded by by world champions, what with John Parrott and Steve Davis and Dennis Taylor, and seven out of the eight gentlemen competing today are all world champions or former world champions. In fact, Neil Robertson and I are beginning to get a bit of a complex. Uh, Neil Robertson's got an awfully better chance of winning it than I will have, that's for (laughs) sure. But um, the Aussie left-hander, Robbo, is a real phenomenon even. He's a coming man in snooker, especially after his breakthrough season last time around. The young Australian, the Melbourne machine, is going to chalk up his first ranking event win. I'd say the greatest performance of my career uh, would probably be winning the Grand Prix in Aberdeen. He comes out, shouts the hand of the new Grand Prix champion from Melbourne, Neil Robertson, a name to be remembered. It was you know, a tremendous feeling, obviously, sort of when I was younger, you know, practicing back home, it's something I'd never dreamed of even doing. Um, and to, to achieve it and then to go on to win another tournament uh, later on in the season was. Yeah, absolutely incredible for me. Today, Neil is up against a player for whom this competition means a great deal. Stephen Hendry's first appearance on the telly was in junior pot black as a small, shy 14-year-old. And it still rankles with him that he lost in the semi. Mind you, he's had the last laugh, going on to win seven world titles thereafter. So, junior pot black, can you believe that was 24 years ago? I know, I know. We looked good, didn't we? <laughs> A few dodgy fashion choices there. I know, me and my chocolate brown dress suit, that was always a killer. I know. Now, the, the tournament itself, Pop Black, it's synonymous with snooker over the years. It was one mm. of the few things you could watch on TV. You can remember the original, can't you? Yeah, it was, it was just, I, thought, I think, coming to, to the end of its um, run when I was sort of starting out. Um, but very popular show, obviously, and uh, as you say, synonymous with snooker, that tune and everything. It was, everyone used to watch it. Now, it's only one frame, I know, but do you actually enjoy this event? Yeah, it's good fun. You know, every, it's all over and done within one day. and. Uh, very quick, very cutthroat. I think the last two years I've, I've been out pretty, pretty sharpish, but um, no, it's, it's great fun for all the players. No, it is quick, so how do you approach it? Are you going to go there and defend, attack, or be steady, or what are you going to do? Um, well, you know me, I'm not going to go out playing safety shots. <laughs> I'll go for, my, go for my pots. All right, good luck today. Cheers, John. Thanks. So it's the game's greatest against Snooker's coming man for a place in the Pop Black semis. Back to Dennis and Steve for this one. Well, it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce seven times world snooker champion Stephen Hendry and the reigning Grand Prix and Welsh Open champion, the Melbourne machine, Neil Robertson. Here we go, Australia versus Scotland. And I think Neil Robertson must be really looking forward to Pop Black. It used to be shown in Australia. In fact, probably even before 
Neil was born, but he knows all about pop like. We had Eddie Charlton used to bring the players out to Australia. Game very popular there in the 70s. <laughs> One very good start from Stephen Hendry. And he's given himself an early chance here. Always nice to get a chance like this, Steve, isn't it? I know there's only Ten. another three reds available, but they're nicely placed, really, aren't they? Yes, well, it's just nice to get amongst the balls, especially in a one-frame match. It's nice to get off to a Eleven. start of any match like this. And these two reds are nicely placed. As long as he's not dead straight on this black, you should be able to... Well, he, may, he may have come unstuck here. The only place, really, that makes it awkward for positional play is dead straight. Do we put that down as a schoolboy error? Yeah, just a fraction, and it, it, it's made a big difference. So now I've got to play the one in the middle, Dennis, and uh, well, now you're trusting to not just good queuing, but also how level the table is. Always was a great centre ball potter. Let's see if he can slot this one in. Looks good to me. Doesn't make many schoolboy errors though. Amongst the balls, the greatest 26 break builder of the game. And there's a few good ones around as well these days. 27. To, to be at the top of the leaderboard in the break building department on a yearly basis or over a 10-year period anyway, shows you the quality of Stephen Hendry. This will take some doing, though, this one. Great shot. He's unlucky. Yes, that's very unlucky again. He couldn't have played that much 34. better. He, he went into them with lots of pace there, opened the reds up, and very unfortunate to finish like that. Just have a look at this. Didn't hit the red full ball because he would have stuck in the back of them, opened them nicely. Very unlucky there. Yeah, he's actually hit it too hard for his own good, really, although we could never Steve have foreseen that. <laughs> but as in our first quarter-final, 30-point uh, lead, advantage Stephen Hendry against the newcomer to the pop black scene, Neil Robertson. <coughs> New territory for Neil. Not just in Pop Black this season, also playing in the Premier League. And of course, uh, top eight players in the world get uh, not just the insurance of being in that top 16 and inv invites into the World Championship uh, final stages, but things like the Masters, guaranteed. And of course, Pop Black. And what company is in here, Steve? Because the other seven players are all former world champions. Well, we've got the current world champion in John Higgins as well, so he's in a very elite field indeed. That's pretty good. All Stephen can do is just roll to the reds here. He can't get the white back to the cushion because he's so close to that cushion. Yes, and even though Stephen Hendry is ranked eight for the coming season, because the defending champion, I believe, was Mark Williams, uh, Stephen Hendry wouldn't have been in this tournament had it not been for the fact that Ronnie O'Sullivan was unable to play. So Stephen, the seven times world champion, is an invite. <laughs> Sneaked in the back door. <laughs> back door Hendry. Oh, 
that could be costly because if he knocks that red in, drops on a colour, the frame's his. Now the Australian has a chance to get right back into this. Well. Now this one. Now the situation is that um, Stephen Hendry's hoping that he he's going to have enough points with that last red on the side cushion. Should Neil get all the way up amongst the balls? Will these reds down the bottom of the table be the sticking point? So. Eight. He's picking off the reds that are up in the bulk area, but you want to get up to these five around the pink as quickly as possible. They're not perfectly placed here by any 12. means, but the three behind the pink, it depends on the, whether the back one's available into the left corner pocket, but that's a few shots from now. Fourteen. Well, that's pretty good. Both of them are available, you would think, so it's a good chance for Neil Robertson here. Fifteen. Yes, but he's going to need these uh, two reds down in the bottom half of the table. Should he try and win the frame in one visit? Some positional shots are going to be played later to perfection. What do you think, Steve? We've had a lot of great potters down the years. People like Perry Mons, an unbelievable potter from South Africa. Mark Williams for years saying the best single ball potter. What about this fella? I think he's right up there. Yeah, he's a great, uh, great striker of the ball. He's got a very distinctive style on, on that right eye of his. He's heads well across over the ball, and uh, he, but he does seem to sight the ball very well. You can see the, using his right eye there. A lot of the left-handed players seem to have this natural ability. Um, many more left-handed players, I think, play great snooker than you know, the percentages of left-handed people in the country. And what about your former partner, who you won the world 31. double six times with Tony Mayo, a great left-handed player, Tony, wasn't he? Yes. So, a little out of position now. He's had to come away from the black spot area. Not ideal. That's uh, a great recovery. You see the side he had on that, the reverse spin. I mean, that was a much better shot than it looked. We might get a, a chance to show you that again, to see the reaction of the 34. white. Now, the natural angle, the white would have been coming over towards the pink. As it hits the cushion, watch it spin. Now, that was superb control there. He's been a bit lax with his position again here. And because of that, he had to do a bit more work with the cue ball. 34. Parity in the frame. But he'd be disappointed. So that red on the side cushion to the right hand side of the table. He's going to play its part in this frame. But this is what Pop Black's all about, isn't it, Steve? One frame. If it's a close, a close frame, that's what people really enjoy at home. They don't really want to see a, a player make a big break and just clinch the frame. They like to see it nice and tight, don't they? That's right. Of course, Ted Lowe would have been commentating so. in the early days of Pop Black and would have said that pink wiped its feet. And the one everybody remembers, Steve, when Ted said the second year pop black was shown. First year was black and white, 1969, 1970, colour television. For those of you watching them, black and white. The yellow is the colour directly behind the blue. That was Ted's. Well, this was very close to missing, but it just about went in. 
A great yeah. shot there from Stephen Hendry, potting the red after that with the rest. And he's played another excellent shot to just nudge that red over the middle. It's just come up a little shy. This is missable. I think he'll go for it. I think he will. He was so close to getting that perfect. This is a tough one. Stephen Henry, 11. It was never easy. Now, if this was an exhibition frame, Neil Robertson would be coming off the top cushion to try and pop. He's thinking about it. <laughs> and it's not an exhibition. And the red is not close enough to the pocket to come off this top cushion and go down and knock the red in. He'd have to be the, so precise. There's prize money this year. <laughs> The thing about this is if he tried to clip it um, and he missed it, he wouldn't lose the frame. The referee would call a miss, but uh, the, trouble, the trouble would be hitting it and leaving it over the pocket, but uh, it's very risky, really. Yeah, it's... I don't think it's close enough to the pocket, is it? If it was closer to the pocket and, and he, if he hits it, he knocks it in, then he'd take it on. I think it depends if he's got any dinner plans for this evening, whether he wants to take this shot on or not. It's an early bath should he miss it. No, he had nothing planned for this evening. Not the <laughs> best safety shot that he could have uh, hoped for because he was really struggling to keep the ball safe. So he's more or less presented Stephen Hendry with the first chance of a good safety shot. And with six colours on the table, you always hope that you can get a snooker. That's not a greatest shot. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, Stephen. Do apologise. <laughs> what a fantastic shot! I thought we were going to hit the green. Uh, from being mm, from being a bit, mm, that's not the greatest shot. It's one of the best safety shots I've ever seen in my life. Uh, don't be exaggerating. Well, I've gone from one one stupidity to the other. What a great shot that was! Not just a great break builder. One of the best safety players in the game. Oh, that's a fantastic shot as well. I'd be cursed if it went into the corner pocket. I think we'll see Stephen Henry take this on into the middle. Big shot coming up. Neil knows if this red goes in, it could be end of frame. And this year's pop black for the Australian. Not an easy one, but it's a half chance. And it's gone safe, I think. Won't pass the black. He would have to put it in off the... He'd have to hit cushion and then the black. As you can see, it won't go directly into the pocket. There's a chance that this could be played and made. It's... The one thing you don't want to do with this shot is to hit it hard. But, of course, you don't really want to be leaving the red over the pocket should you miss it. So that's the dilemma. It is gettable. Cushion first, but not too... Not too hard. Is he playing it safe? One. I think he put everything into getting the angle right. If he had to stop the white dead, he'd have been perfect on the brown. As it is now, he's just going to play the snooker. So he didn't quite get the white where he intended. It's pretty, pretty good now, though. Yes, even though there's a difference in the frame scores, it's advantage Neil Robertson. Stephen Henry's going to do not just well to hit this, but get it safe as well. Foul and miss. Neil Robertson, four. Never easy yeah. to pick an angle out on a... Well, there's a new table here, a new cloth. Most tables play similar, but sometimes they slide off the cushion. What Stephen's got to play this shot is if he was trying to shoot the white off the side cushion into the corner pocket, and if he picks that line, he will hit the yellow. I think he's going to settle for this. Couldn't possibly have hoped. Oh, is he looking upset? You can see it look happy there does he well, he never looks happy though does he <laughs> 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 
Great character, Stephen, by the way. It's nice to see, uh, I mean, in a way, sort of this, how people change over the years. Stephen's uh, sort of, the public have warmed to Stephen in the same way as they may have done to me. I've got to know him a bit better now. Well, you always were a bit of a character. It's just you <laughs> looked so serious back in the 80s. I've got to get this one in. That was a way out. Yes, I don't think we uh, we want to talk about that effort. He was a mile off that. I mean, you can see the smile tells you what he thinks about that effort. Oh, he's, his elbow hit a waiter there in the second row. Well, I think he'll be playing all season and not miss a ball by that far. He may be OK, because if the Brown is blocking the green from potting, this isn't a chance... No. But best you could hope for, though, isn't it? Does the green pass the brown? It must do. Well, he's, he's not likely to take it on now that the pink's in the way of his cue. This is a very difficult shot to play. Can he get past the... Oh, he may be able to play this, then. Well, it was enough of a, a problem, the pink ball, that it... Worried the shot, so to speak, but he's typical pot black frame, this isn't it? Loads of luck, that's what you want. And he certainly had it there, pink blocking the path. Advantage Stephen Hendry again, though. <laughs> and very clever to leave the green away from a cushion. It means that there's enough room to possibly slip around the back of it, although the one cushion escaped should get him out of it but all sorts can go wrong you can leave the green on you can hit the green and go in off it i think slow is better than fast here i thought perhaps if he could played that slow and was much much more certain that he was going to leave it safe as it is he knew exactly what he was doing Not easy to get a snooker from that position. Just making sure he got the green safe, really. There's the view that some of our audience have. Uh, probably the people at the back. Not the perfect viewing. But snooker, you're normally on tiered seating, so everyone can see perfectly. But it's, it's a nice, cosy atmosphere, this. It's like the worst view. Is that what you're, <laughs> it's the worst view you could possibly have. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you should bring your own little box with you. <laughs> I think this frame, Steve, now is all about the blue that's not perfectly placed. You'd have to get nicely in behind it, so that's going to be the key ball here as to who goes through to the semi-final. That was a shot and a half, that was. Well, I think he's... That caused all sorts of problems if he snookered him there. Oh, no. Looks like he can swerve it. At the very worst. Foul. Oops. Yes. Oh, put that lot back. <laughs> Not too sure we've got the uh, the technology that we have at the World Championship here to put these balls back in exactly the same position. Arian Williams here praying that the balls are not being asked. Please don't put them back. Please. <laughs> I don't want to have to do this. Neil's going to try and take the frame by the scruff of the neck here. Bit of a twitchy one, and that can happen. It's a bit like a deciding frame, you know, the, the well, tension it is. amongst... Yes, it sort of is in a way, isn't it? Yes. He could clearly have had that replaced again, but he fancied knocking it in and getting on the brown. As it is now, it's Stephen Hendry who's got a chance. Oh, not a bad little nudge on the blue there, and the blue now is in the perfect Green. position, so no reason why Stephen shouldn't pop the brown and come nicely onto the blue here. 
Yeah, amazing how that foul stroke by Stephen Hendrys sort of helped him to possibly win the frame. Bizarre game snooker sometimes. Obviously, Neil could have had those balls replaced. Good queuing with the rest again there. So may, may have to play another one with the. Well, I'm not too sure whether he can reach this. It's going to be a bit of a stretch. Ooh, three shots with the rest on the row to win the frame. If he gets this anywhere near the pink, I'm sure he's won the frame. He can reach it this time, so uh, Neil, if he had to do it again, would have the balls replaced, but he took the chance and it didn't come off. It's and it'll be a Stephen pretty Henry. relief, Stephen Hendry. Um, Lee Robertson Henry. didn't quite make it his first time in Pop Black. It's the seven times former world champion that takes the frame and goes through to the semi-final. And a very fine win indeed. Happy to get through, Stephen? Yes, uh, the last two years I've lost my first match, so it's nice to, nice to win one. What was uh, the key element in it for you, John? Um, certainly the last five colours. The most important ball was the green. Were you surprised Neil didn't put you back there? Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, it was a, a ball I still expected him to make, but it was quite a, quite a tricky positional shot. And I think if he'd made me play again, the speed I had to hit it to hit the green, I was almost certain to leave something on. So maybe easier than that. But thankfully, he decided to take it on and, and missed it. Well, you're through. You have been listening to the commentary, however. Stephen Dennis giving you absolute what a pelters. Double act, eh? Yeah, what a double Absolutely. act indeed. Calling you backdoor Hendry, relying I on know, invitations I to know. get in this. What's the world come to? I know. Rank number eight and having to rely on people pulling out of tournaments. <laughs> terrible, but I'll take it. Yeah, because it is a tournament that's special to you, Stephen, yeah. particularly when you look back to all that footage, which um, I'm sure you'll be delighted mm. to know we're going to run again. Oh, thank you. That's a 14 year old. What do yeah. you think when you see pictures of yourself like I know, this? I know. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing how much the the, the, the cue action, everything looks looks so different. Um, and it's just like it's sort of like raw talent, as it were. You just instinct is just playing, and now you, you you know you look at everything so seriously. Now your cue action, the technique, everything. But then you're just playing for fun, which is nice. Do you see the same facets? Do you see the same raw talent in Blaine, your son? Uh, yeah, actually. I mean, the, the cue action is very very similar to to Blaine's cue action now. It's um, so he, he's he's got a lot of talent, and it looks. Pretty similar to that, but uh, you know, if he does anything, that's uh, be fantastic. He's anything like me. He's, he's won a junior tournament already, though, wasn't he? He's won lots of little trophies in his little league that he plays in, and uh, he says he wants to be a snooker player, but he's got a, a bit to go. But he's had a, a century break on his six-foot table at home, so he, he can play. Fantastic. How long before we see him in junior pot black? You reckon? Um, we we'll start running it. I think I might have a bit of influence to get an entry, what do you think? <laughs> Maybe, absolutely. <laughs> well, John, don't sit there looking smug because you're not getting away with that oh, either. You we too were a junior pot there black. Oh, nice oh, sure. Look at that. Oh. Is that there tweed? Brown was the new black. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> is, that, is that tweed? Uh, that's, um, that's chocolate brown, that tie, believe it or not. Goodness me. Look at that. I look like a pipe cleaner. <laughs> There's nothing wrong <laughs> me, isn't there? Oh, but you have got one up on Stephen because you won it twice. Stephen, you made the semis, didn't you? I made the semis, yeah. yeah. I, was, was... I made a 45 break in the semi and, and played a dodgy safety and Steve Ventham, I don't know where he is nowadays, but he cleared up and I was devastated. Do you think it still rankles with him by any chance? It is. He I remembers was... it was a 45 break. He was remember <laughs> exactly. Steve Ventham in a semi final. I remember all the defeats. The win's a bit hazy, but all the defeats, <laughs> yeah. they still hurt. Well, well, actually, when you look ahead, Stephen, that we're working this out. This is, what, the start of your 23rd professional? season incredible yeah. really when you when you think back over all these years how do you get up for yet another one um basically if i didn't think I could, you know if i was watching players and think well they, he's too good for me I, I would stop but basically i still think i'm good enough to win and uh that, that gives me the hunger that i need to go in and, and, and work and uh you know if i you know i've changed q which has been publicized a lot and which is which is now starting to bear fruit i think the q i'm using now and and you know, I'm very excited about the new season. Practice-wise, what's the difference? In the, is there any difference in your regime than when you were really, you know, at your best winning the world titles? Do more hours, less hours? What do you do? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, doing a bit, doing a bit more, but I'm, I'm, I'm putting a lot of effort into, into, um, you know, I'm doing some different things on the practice table and stuff. So it's, um, you know, I'm excited about my game for a while. I've started to play really well and uh, looking forward to the season. Yeah. Well, you got Sean Murphy next in the semi-final. I don't suppose that will be a safety-oriented. Thing no, I think, I think both of us will probably like to go out guns blazing. <laughs> Attacks we'll on top. To it. Go and carb a load, you've just got time to get your uh, 
your main course then, Stephen. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well, while Stephen goes for the rest of his lunch, we'll reflect on another world champion, another Scot, in fact, John Higgins. It's really five months almost to the day since John kept us up till one o'clock in the morning as he finally saw off the limpet-like Mark Selby in the Crucible final at the World Championships. It was his second title, and albeit that it was the wee hours of the morning, there was absolutely no way that his son, Pierce, was going to miss out on this occasion. Look at the smile on his face. 63. He will be feeling absolutely fantastic in the sun. It's John Higgins who wins the 2007 888.com World Championship. So, world champion again, but let's be honest. Is that better than Celtic beat Nice in Milan? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a bit of both, I suppose. Yeah. No, obviously, winning it again, John, it was, it's probably been the highlight of my career, winning it again. So, yeah, I was over the moon last year. So, what's the summer been like? Been immense satisfaction knowing you've won it again? Yeah, I think so, John. Now, as you know, having won it yourself, it's. Uh, you, you, I, I didn't know if I would ever win it again, but to, to actually win it again, now, it, was, it was a fantastic feeling. Do you enjoy it more the second time? I think so. I think uh, when I was younger, uh, you didn't really take it in the enormity of what you've actually done, but uh, this second time winning it, you're a different person, you're, a, you're married, you've got your own family life, and uh, it was definitely a, a better feeling second time around. Now, Pop Black's only one frame, yeah. how are you going to approach this? Yeah, just to go out and enjoy it, obviously, uh, playing Ken, it's, it's going to be a tough match. Uh, I think the last time we played, it was in the final of uh, Malta, when he beat me 9-8, and then we were proceeded to throw off an aeroplane, so, uh, so hopefully <laughs> if, we play, if we play again that won't happen to us again, but no, back to the series side, it'll be a tough match, obviously one frames, anybody can win. Well, a decent record, you're finalist last year with Mark Williams, so one better then? Yeah, it'd be great to do it again, obviously, any, any tournament you enter you want to win it, but it's, it's going to be, I think, very much a toss here going, I think. No, good luck, John. Cheers, John. Well, John's first world title was nine years ago, back in 1998, as he was saying. And today, he's drawn Ken Doherty, the man he beat in the final back then. The Irishman remains one of Snooker's best-loved characters. And there was always going to be a fair bit of crack flying around in this one. John alongside Dennis in the box for this frame. Well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome this former world champion, the darling of Dublin, Ken Doherty, and the reigning world champion and world number one, the Wizard of Wishaw, John Higgins! <laughs> Here we go, two former world champions battling out. Smiles all around. It is. And John Higgins has won the Thank toss. You. Could be your last. <laughs> <laughs> John Higgins to break. I don't know what he said there, John. Typical, typical <laughs> Ken Doherty. Ken said, have a good shot, John. It could be your last. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what it might be if that white doesn't keep on running. If it's blocked the path. This tournament. <laughs> I'm one frame a day. <laughs> I think one of the best lines I, I ever heard was Cliff Thorburn and, and Pop Black, uh, senior Pop Black. We did down at the Goodwood House, and there's paintings there worth millions. And it was in this beautiful room. And Cliff says, I don't know how to make this club pair with one table. <laughs> 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 Well, a great pot from Ken Doherty. <laughs> He's enjoying himself out there. He may be having a laugh there, but I tell you what, Dennis, nobody practised more than Ken this morning. <laughs> He's a shrewd little Irishman, this boy. Yeah, and he's got the most infectious laugh in the world. You can hear him from miles away. He really enjoys himself, Ken Doherty. Great ambassador for snooker and also for Ireland. Seven. Eight. And although this is a one-frame challenge, 
These two have cracking matches. They've got very similar games. Both excellent match players. And when Ken gets scoring, and scoring heavily, he is a match for anybody. That's why he's been a world champion. 13. Ideally, Ken would like to remove the red that's on the black spot at some point, 19. if not next in the Probably the best ball to take then, really, isn't it? Just to open that black spot up, out and uh, get it back on its spot. Yeah, that's exactly what he's looking at. It just depends on the angle he has here. Twenty. Now, where is the black going to go? It's going to go as near... If it goes as near its own spot, the black will be available, but I don't think the red will. We, we'll see very shortly. Now, that's why he's played back for the other one. So when the black is replaced, it will pot, but the red won't. It's got to go as near to the spot in a direct line behind it without touching the red. Well, he must have had a good look at it. I think Ken thinks that that black will pot anyway, but it'll be from the opposite side. So I don't think he's got the right angle there. And if he plays the cannon here, he's got to be careful. I don't think he's bothering with that. Uh, a good choice there. 28. White anywhere over that side of the table was going to leave himself on a choice of colours. Yeah, that was interesting, uh, John. If it had a, been a, f a full match, he might have tried to develop the black, but just with it being the one frame, he was just making sure That's there, it. wasn't he, that he didn't play the cannon and, and put them safe? Yes, he's uh, always been a master at playing percentages, Ken. Very good last frame player, so this format should suit him. So a key shot coming up, already 31 in front. If he gets the cannon onto the pink and reds, this could pave the way to clinching the frame. Well, I'm just wondering, Dennis, whether that red that's next to the black does pot and he's going to screw off the brown down for it. He had a little look at it. It's very tight. He may, in fact, take the yellow. He's decided for the pack. You were quite right. How's his look? Just OK, I think. Get past the red that's next to the black to get to the potting angle of the other one. Played it pretty well. Thirty-four. Well, Ken made a joke at the start of this frame. That could be your last shot, John. And the way he's going, he might actually be his last shot. He's taken <coughs> these very well so far. I'd absolutely love to know whether that red or black are going, because Ken keeps looking at it. It's one of those, John, isn't it? You can't make your mind up. One of them it. goes, but you can't make your mind up which one pots. It's always difficult to just judge. I also think looking from behind the pocket is an absolute waste of time, Dennis. So you can always make them go from behind the pocket. You need to go the other side, don't you? Looking at that, you think the red would go, wouldn't you? Well, Ken must have thought the red didn't pot, but our camera angle showed you clearly, and there you can see it again. The red definitely pots, so I think that was the wrong choice there. He should have played for that one. He didn't play on it, and will that shot come back to haunt him? In fact, it might, because there's a red available into the right middle pocket here. And that's the one that John's taking on, so... If this goes in, he can get right back in the frame. 
Not quite, but it would go. So another chance for Ken. Red next to the pink goes. Yes, the red goes by the pink then, but what's his colour after that? So I think he's decided he's going to play the chip in the middle. Well played. A lot tougher shot than it looked that. Yeah, safer option, the fact that he could get through to that potting angle because he wasn't really going to leave a great deal and he was always going to be on a colour, so... It's the second chance for Crafty Ken, and has he made a mess of it? He had so much margin for Wait. error there. And I think he might still be able to snick this one in, but he overscrewed that by quite a way. Yes, the one thing you needed to be with that shot was short, wasn't it? As long as you left yourself, you know, a couple of feet away from the reds, you were guaranteed to have a pot. I mean, I still think he'll get this, but position's going to be tricky. Four. Pink goes, but not quite on it. It should get this, though. See, the pink spot looks to be occupied, so that means the red won't be available and the pink's replaced. So it'll be the one next to the blue. Funny how frames work out then, isn't it? We've got a frame here where the pink's being tied up, black being tied up. You can you can have session after session and and not see that. Both balls nearly touching other reds. Hello. John Higgins got to the final of Pop Black last year and he lost to Mark Williams. But uh, I don't think he's going to advance any further this year. He hasn't really had much of a chance. One red into 50. the middle pocket. Was a half chance for him, missed that, and that's it. Looks to be all over, already 54 in front. So he's just looking for the blue and one more red, and that shouldn't be a problem. <coughs> well, he did actually throw John Higgins somewhat 20. of a lifeline with that red in the centre, but... John didn't make it, and since then it's been very steady from Ken. All he can do is sit and watch. And with being 59 in front here, Ken just take the loose red. Don't really have to worry about position or anything too much here. Just knock that in. 21. 60 ahead and three reds on. More or less over the line, so he'll take this black on now. Well, a bit of a careless shot on the black, but it shouldn't make a great deal of difference. You would think that Ken Doherty <laughs> takes himself in to the semi-final. Just a possible 51 points on the table. He's 60 behind, so that tells you he's going to need a couple of snookers. One. Yes, and the tricky thing here for John is, aside from anything else, <laughs> ideally, in a perfect world, he'd like that red just a little bit away from the black spot so he could end up snookering behind it, but the black's going to go on the pink. Another red, another black, and then he'll have to work out a different type of snooker. <laughs> Ken is talking about holes in somebody's pocket there. <laughs> Never misses a trick. He's the, dar the darling of Dublin, that's a great name that they call Ken. He's a good lad. Always full of fun.
is that red we were talking about earlier. And, you know, ideally, he'd love that to have been a little bit away from the black spot. It'd been an easy snooker, but now 60. he's got a bit more work. Always handy having that black on its spot then for snookers, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, John. In fact, it looks as if he's going to need... Uh, well, he's going to need and three snookers, 60. believe it or not. Yeah, it's asking a lot at the level they're playing at. Although I somehow managed to lose from 52 in front with one red on one time, but we won't remember that one in the semi-final of the Benson Hedges. Very nice. Oh, who were you playing, John? Thanks, Dennis. Mike Hallett, I was. <laughs> Mike Hallett, who, yeah. who should have won the, the B and H, uh, lost to Stephen Hendry after leading 8-1, I think it was. Mm, well, don't remind me of that. I was, I was too busy. I was uh, sulking. <laughs> Not like you, John. I was, you in, I was in captivity, as you say. <laughs> Oh, look at that. There's a little gap right between the black, the blue, and the green. And a little guide <laughs> to take the red into the pocket. One. Thanks for calling. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for company, Senator. <laughs> it's a good job he knows John very well. <laughs> I'll tell you honestly, it's a good job John's been getting a chance to take the Nifty out of this. He's having a, he's really Six. enjoying it. Oh. He'll be thumping him behind the curtain in a minute though. Eight. But I think it's a it's, it's a great tournament pop like for the players to relax a one frame. So you know they take it very, very seriously, but uh, you see the the side of the players that sometimes you don't see Eleven. in a yeah, and something great, like the world championship. I mean, the thing is, as well, is John's such a good lad as well. He knows he knows that Ken's just 15. ribbing him a little bit. That's all it is. Look at him! Look, He's having a little <laughs> smirk to himself, there, isn't he? Two nice lads you couldn't hope to meet. Oh. Yeah, I think John will shake hands. Yeah, he shakes hands with referee McKenna Tan, and of course his opponent Ken Doherty, who got off to an early start in this frame and it paved the way for him to go on to give himself a place in the semi-final well played both players very enjoyable very enjoyable indeed and that was notable for ken's good play and his supreme cheek i have to say you were <laughs> in your element out there Ken. Weren't you? well as i said it's not often you get the chance to like rib john a little bit so you might as well take advantage of it while you can you know what did you say enjoy your break off shot it might be the last one you get. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, I should have actually told him to sit down. He was standing like he was ready to get another shot there. I should have told him to sit down and you know, rest a little bit. It is quite a relaxed atmosphere. <laughs> all the players, we all know each other very well. Enough yeah, to yeah. actually, you know, especially in Pop Black, to have a bit of fun. The, the bigger tournaments, out of respect to mm. people's yeah, yeah. form and how they're yeah, feeling, course, you yeah, wouldn't yeah. do something like that. No. But even so, it's still nice to turn the world champion over, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is nice. Yeah. I, as you said, like it's very relaxed. It's a bit of a laugh, and I'm sure. You know, John got the opportunity to do exactly what to me as like I'd done to him today. You know, but you know, it's more relaxed. It's a great, it's a great tournament, and uh, it's it, it's great for the people to see a different side of the players mm. as well. You know, exactly, mm. Ken. And it, it seems to me like it's more like the atmosphere that you would get in a practice room. There's yeah. a bit of banter flying it's around. It's more, yeah, a practice room or exhibition. You know, I mean, Steve Davis and I have done lots of exhibition, and it's just a bit of fun. And as soon as you get an opportunity, you take it. You know, and. Uh, uh, like you know as I said ribbing each other you know because like um, as I said the other lads would do it as well you know and you know people don't see that on TV when it's more serious like in, in Aberdeen next week or you know the world championship it's a lot more serious and out of respect you, you don't do something like that. there is an occasion where you can do it and it's not so meaningful mm. but uh, here it's very relaxed and it's it's shown a different side of snooker and that's why I think it's it's great it's a great event for snooker you know in that respect but as John John uh, Parrott said you know the players still want to do well want to oh, win yeah. I mean and your competitive spirit over yeah. the years has maintained I mean you've been you seem to have been around for as long as well, you well, <laughs> Not that long. Not that long, sure. <laughs> well, it seems like you know you've been competitive player now for so so long, and, and you still maintain that very high level of enthusiasm for the game. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm like you, like you love the game. We both love the game. We love competing. You know, the practice and the travel and and that can be quite uh, tedious and times. But uh, I think when you get on the table, you love the competition and being competitive and trying to win. And if not, you you're trying to enjoy it while you can. You know, because you know. In, in a lot of sports, uh, you know, we're lucky that we have a, a sort of 
more longevity in our sport, but other sports they don't, you know, so we might as well enjoy it while we can. Well, you've already won a tournament this season, Ken, the Irish Professional Championship. You retained your title. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, how important is that to you, particularly at the beginning of a season as you get on the way? Well, I mean, it's nice for us to have our own professional uh, national championships, and uh, it may not mean, as I said before, it may not mean to many people in, in, in other countries around the world, but to us, it's like pride of place it's to win your national championships and uh, we have we hadn't had it for for 12 years until a couple of years ago when it was sponsored by Victor Chandler and, and it's great to have it back on our tour and it's very very small but it means as much to us as like you know maybe winning like any of the ranking events at the world championship because like we're very very pr proud over there and like even competing against each other we all get on well with each other and we're all good friends but when we get on the table, as Steve says, it's very competitive and to be national champion or as professional national champion, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice honour to have. Ambitions for the coming season, Ken, what are they going to be? Yeah, I mean, it's a nice little confidence booster, you know, to be fair, like 9-2 in the final was great. Uh, not for him, but for me, like, and it's a good confidence booster. Uh, so hopefully, you just never know. You go from tournament to tournament and form is like, it's very temporary. You just don't know uh, how you're going to play from one tournament to the next, you know. Uh, but you just... You just try and prepare and do your best and if you win a tournament and you go there feeling a bit more confident, well then that can only be a good thing. Yeah. Alex Higgins making a comeback. Are Alex Higgins, yeah. Alex yeah. Higgins yeah. was there. He came down and practiced with me for uh, for one of the days, would you believe? We had two frames that he sat down and read the paper and had a point of Guinness <laughs> and a bag. <laughs> and that was his preparation. But it was uh, we had a great time. But it was great to have him back, I must say. And it was great to have him back. Well it's great to see you here, Kent. You're into the semi finals. Yeah. Go and prepare for that. And okay. uh, we will concentrate on the last of these quarters. We were saying earlier, usually in Sheffield, quarter-final stages takes about 10 days to get to. So it's <laughs> yeah, rather nice true. to go straight in, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, of course. It <laughs> anyway, this last one does feature the reigning and defending pop black champion Mark Williams. He actually threw in a 119 break in the final last year to take this, and he's the fifth Welshman to win it. After that, though, well, didn't do too well in the season. He won only two more matches, you see. It might be a little trophy, but it's a heavy burden to carry this pot black. My greatest performance would probably be winning the second World Championship for me. If you've done it once, you know, that's good enough for, for most people really, but you always want to do it the second time, to, because not that many people have won it the second time. My greatest strength is my long potting, really, although it's probably one of my weakest strengths at the minute, but my long potting was my, my strongest strength. Whereas I was probably favourite to win most of the matches I played in, now I'm probably the underdog, which you know can work in your favour. So I still feel I got the game to get back up there, obviously. Just need a few matches to get a bit of confidence back and, and off you go. Second Pot Black, you've got Mark Williams, but do you remember Pot Black as a kid? I can vaguely remember it. I think I probably should remember it. I can not probably as much as some of the other players. Now, last year was a, a very good year for you, not just obviously coming in as world champion, but uh, you won the China Open, and your standard of snooker seemed to be fantastic. Yeah, I played really well. I think I enjoyed having, having the pressure of being world champion, and I think it showed in my game, and winning in China, but it was probably the least I could have done. I think I played well enough to actually do better than that, but it was still a good year. Disappointing in the World Championship? Yeah, I think um, what happened, my form before that probably hindered me going to the World Championships. I think I played probably too many matches than I was used to playing and I felt a little bit burnt out by the time I reached the, the World. In some ways, for me, you're the most improved player on the circuit over the last five or six years, uh, but obviously you've got to keep that up. What's your aspirations for this season? Basically the same as the past three or four, as you said, I've been relatively consistent over the past three or four years and hopefully I can keep doing that and, and, try, and try and win as many tournaments as possible and get to number one in the world. Well, he's getting there because the pocket dynamo, Graham Dot, now up to a career high of number two in the world rankings and he, like Mark Williams, knows exactly what it takes to win in Sheffield. Which of them will achieve that in this frame? Ladies and gentlemen, the defending pot black champion, the Welsh potting machine, Mark Williams, and the reigning China Open champion, the pocket dynamo, Graham Dart. <laughs> Thank you, coffee. 
Sahet. Oh, I think uh, Graham actually won the toss and he wants Mark, Mark to break. That's what we, you know, used to be always frightened of winning the toss on the one framer, John. In case you stick that red out on the side <laughs> of the pack. Yeah, let the other fellow have a go for that one there on the right hand side. Is he covering it? Oh, it hasn't. So let's see if Graham Dot's decision is right. It's right if he knocks the long one in, but if he misses it, uh... it's wrong. <laughs> Correct. Believe, believe it or not. <laughs> One. Well, he's played it very well. OK, he's the wrong side of the blue, but the main part of the object there was to knock that long red in and no problem going in and out of balk here to get onto a red there's two or three available yes that's what the players are so good at now i think dennis that the quality of the the long pottons Six. is just superb and that was an excellent crisp really well struck shot yeah i think that's the difference isn't it from sort of 30 years ago i mean we did have some great long potters uh, one of the early pop black winners and three times world champion John Spencer was a terrific long potter, probably the best of his era, John. So it was decision to put Mark Williams into bat. Might actually be quite fruitful the game, Dot. So Well, that got a massive bounce off the side cushion. There's no way he's played position there. And it's certainly got a ping. Went on all right, but boy, did that come off quick. <laughs> you could see there Graham staring long and hard at the reaction he got. 30. Always takes the table a while to bed in, but... But it's amazing, it's uh, caused the problem OK. Hasn't got a good white, fortunately, for him here, because although the red's available, how's Mark Williams going to get on a colour? Because the black may be available into the same pocket that he would take this red, but I'll tell you what, to get the white over behind that would be some shot from here. Well, he gave it as good a chance as he possibly One. could. It's a thin snick. It will open the game up. So, big shot coming up. Mark Williams won. Well, has he left that red? With Graham Dots looking at it's very tight there. Can he get past the pink to see the potting angle? No, looking at that, he can't. What do you think then? Looks very tight, John. I'm with you. He's getting the spider out, but uh, I mean, he's directly behind it, so he's probably in the best position. But from the other side, it looked very tight indeed. From that angle, it may do, mightn't it, because he's playing away from the pink, so that, ang that camera angle looked a little better, but it is tight. Oh, flies in. Where did you get your glasses made, Dennis? Um, I'll tell you what, John, they didn't make them in an hour, that's for sure. I think I need to go. Well, he took the chance there. There was a few reds available. He thought, I might as well go into them. Eight. OK, that one into the middle is on, the left middle, one to the right <coughs> middle. He's got a choice of reds here. They opened nicely, but it was amazing how the white went into the balk area and then come right back up the table. You never know where the white's going to finish when you play that type of shot. Yes, he played for 
right in the meat of the bunch there, didn't he? And just sort of flicked off it, but that's not a bad result he's ended up with there. Drops this one and it's a massive frame chance. Nine. A very good player, Graham Dot. Very underestimated. As I say, you don't become a world champion if you haven't got grit and determination. And he certainly showed it the year that he won. There were some wars of attrition through that tournament and uh, he came through the lot of them. Good, good match player. Never easy to beat. Yeah, he was very underestimated for quite a few seasons, living in the shadows of Stephen Hendry, John Higgins. 40. But uh, he's a terrific player. He's world ranked number two, provisionally number three, very consistent. And a real little battler, isn't he, John? Yes, Dennis. I also think practicing with John Higgins has been a big help in his development. You know, you play with John and, well, if you don't concentrate and mind your business there, you could spend the afternoon picking balls out. So playing match play against Mr Higgins is uh, certainly good for your development. I think it's done both of the players a lot of good. 22. Yeah, it's a very good point, that, because John Higgins learned his craft practising with Stephen Hendry. They played thousands of frames together, and, and John had a... I think it's a bit of a unique record. Got to be world number one and world champion in six seasons. I think the nearest to that was Mark Williams. He did it in seven seasons. 30. Yes, and talking of Mark Williams, he's a he's a player who needs a big season. A few years ago, he held all of the four BBC events that we covered, and we thought, who's going to come along and beat him? And unfortunately, the last couple of years, it's been very barren. Hasn't played with the same amount of confidence. 31. And when you get on that slippery slope, players don't fear you anymore and you start missing the odd ball here and there and it doesn't take too much for you to slip down the ranking list so he's got a big season ahead of him 30. yeah I never thought I would be saying it about Mark Williams but he's provisionally ranked 42 in the world that is quite incredible but he's a player that can pull it back 39 And at the moment, all he can do, Mark, is watch 44. Graham Dot, who's quite impressively going about his work. Knows this the big chance for the frame. Just checking to see if the pink goes there, because if the pink does pot in the top left-hand pocket, it's ideal to open up a few more reds after this one. So we'll soon find out. Yes, he's played on it. 45. So if he knocks this one in, these should open up like a little bunch of flowers. Any particular type of flowers, John, you'd like to see here? Carnations, Dennis. There you go. Is that happy for you? <laughs> that looks pretty good to me. 51. 52. So the defending champion is uh, not going to get much of a look in here. Can't do much about this. 59. Very impressive. In a one frame match. 60. To make anything over 50 usually wins you the frame. I think we've only ever had two century breaks in the, the history of Pop Blank, John. Yes, 66. many years ago, Eddie Charlton had a 110, which stood for years and years and years, and then we 67. reinstigated Pop Black, and Sean Murphy said, what's all the fuss about, and had a 122 break, I think. So. There may have also been another one. Mark Williams, I think, in the final last year might have made one as well. So there could possibly be three in the history of it. But 73. I know Sean Murphy definitely made one. But this is mightily impressive from Graham, even though he's missed that one. Thank you for you. Yeah, Mark Williams comes forward, smiles all around again. But it was very impressive from the Scott Graham dot. He got that terrific break, which paved the way for the frame and takes him in to the semi-final. 
Well, in the early pot blacks, most players needed five or six bites of the cherry to get over the line, but the modern day snooker is different. If you played the whole season, two visits as you've done there, you'd be sort of in front, I would imagine. Yeah, that, that's the main aim at every frame you play. You've, you've, as you said, the game's changed so much. And when you get one chance, you've kind of got to kill it right away or you feel you're going to lose the frame. Do you think you've changed your game over the years? Yeah, after the after winning the world title, I've changed. Because I think, um, even though I think I would have done OK, Playing the way that I was playing, I thought I had to change because the game's so tough now. And of course, century breaks are a very important part of the game. You expected to get one there? Yeah, I should have got one. I mean, I've, I'm kind of famous for doing that, getting to 70 odd and then missing something silly. But I was trying for the century, it would have been nice. So now you're off and running, looking forward to trying to win the thing now? Yeah, it'd be great to win it. But as you <laughs> said, the game's so tough in one frame. I mean, it's. I deliberately don't try and break off because it's that, that tough. I just want to see a red and have a go and, and hopefully win the frame. Oh, good luck for the rest of it. Thank you. And so after rattling through those quarterfinals, this is the lineup for our pot black semis. It's Sean Murphy who will be playing Stephen Hendry. And then Ken Doherty is up against the pocket dynamo, Graham Dot.